Oh, yep, there it is. All right, everyone. So good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Graduate Student Essentials, Tools for Building Scholarly Presence. Um, Marco Seifley Valencia, um, the Open Education Librarian here at the University of Idaho Library. And I'm really excited to be doing this session with you all this afternoon. Um, let's just kind of dive right in. So our goals for this workshop is going to be to help you to become familiar uh, with several key possibilities for developing your personal scholarly presence. So some of the topics we're gonna cover include ORCID, uh, Google Scholar Author Profiles, traditional scholarly metrics, um, though I will add the caveat that that's in brief because that's a, a pretty in-depth topic, alt metrics and social media and professional web presence. I also wanna draw your attention to this URL down here. Um, if you're someone who likes to follow along, maybe you wanna check out some of these links um, or maybe you wanna refer back to this later, this is the URL that this presentation is at, tinyurl.com forward slash scholarly hyphen presence. So if you go there um, now, later, uh, this whole presentation is there. So I just like to let you know that and that URL will be on every page too. And most of you are probably aware, but we are also recording this session and it'll be posted um, on the library's YouTube page. So there's lots of ways to come back and find this content. Um, don't stress out if you don't have uh, quite what you need uh, all in this one session. The goal is more just to let you know these things are out there and get you thinking about how you might use them. So let's keep on going. So uh, what is scholarly presence? Um, if we were all able to meet together in person, uh, this might be a, a time where I would ask you all to kind of tell me what you think. So instead, since we're on Zoom and it's a little cumbersome to have people unmute, just take a moment and think about what does scholarly presence mean to you? Is it something that you have a, a pretty clear concept on or is it something that's kind of new for you? I would say um, that for me, even as a a librarian and an open education librarian where we're often thinking about scholarly presence, um, I still feel like I'm learning. Um, so just to kind of give folks a, a kind of brief definition that I came up with for this talk that I think is useful, uh, something to think about with scholarly presence is how the internet and the web uh, changed basically what it means to have a scholarly presence. So think about pre-web, um, I might be dating myself here, but I really like the Indiana Jones movies when I was a kid. And you know, there's a sort of vision of like a kind of stereotypical professor that was the way Indiana Jones was not. And that kind of stereotypical professor, you know, they go to like sort of like stuffy proceedings and conferences and talks, and that's where they would have a scholarly presence, right? So thinking about pre-web, a lot of that scholarly presence happened in these sort of traditional formats, like papers, proceedings, uh, maybe giving a talk or even an informal conversation at a conference and even service appointments on different committees. Um, now in the post web world, all of those things still apply. So um, if any of you go on to pursue or indeed now are pursuing various types of um, trajectories that lead you to being a faculty person, um, you will still do all those pre web things. But you also need to think about all these other post web things, right? So websites and blogs, social media, both professional and private analytics and research and scholarly profile platforms. So the goal of this presentation, as I mentioned, is just to kind of get your toes wet and thinking about these things. So just to kind of dive in, let's think about um, what an intentional scholarly presence means, right? So one of the kind of interesting things about this new digital environment we find ourselves in is that our scholarly presence can be crafted for us um, by our, social, our personal social media and other web histories if we don't engage. Um, so there's, it's harder to just sort of like sit this one out. Um, you thinking of that older example I had there of how, you know, things used to be pre-web. Uh, if you didn't go to a conference, maybe people didn't uh, find out about your research or something, but they also didn't, you know, find your old embarrassing undergraduate Facebook photos either. So it's kind of a different landscape with some different considerations. Um, the other thing about intentional scholarly presence is that it can do some work for you. So it can create opportunities for collaboration and connection with colleagues. Um, both in your discipline and also across disciplines. So let's talk about um, kind of one of the core things that comes up when we think about a scholarly presence, which is something called ORCID. Um, I sometimes call this ORC ID, uh, but that's just because I liked uh, the Tolkien novels. So basically what an ORCID does is it creates a durable URL with a unique number where you can create a digital CV and a profile. Um, it's especially good if you're in a situation where you have a name that might easily get confused with someone else's because this barcode basically for you is totally unique, right? So even if your name is, um, 
Abigail Martinez and there's a million Abigail Martinez's, you know, it's okay because you have your own unique number and you can say, no, I'm this Abigail and this is the work that I've done. Um, you can set it up so that it automatically updates um, from different publications. So if you're um, having a kind of either a start or already underway in a scholarly publishing career, you can have it set up so that it's connected and automatically updated when you do something. And you're responsible for creating and maintaining your profile. So I'm going to uh, click on this link for us to take a look. And this is one of my personal heroes. Uh, her name is Marissa Duarte, and she's a librarian and information scholar at Arizona State University. And this is uh, her ORCID, which is very nicely filled out. She has her complete employment history. She has her education and qualifications, including down to her undergraduate work. Uh, she has some of her service positions. She has some of her grants listed. And she also does a great job of listing her journals and other publications here. So Marissa was someone that I saw give a talk at a conference. And because she has this great web presence, it was really a lot easier for me to find her and for me to learn about her work. So um, if you've been to a conference um, or if you haven't yet, you can imagine, you know, you're hearing all these different people speak and, you know, usually you write down their name or something and then you want to go and find them later. So having something like this really helps because it's very easy for me to find her. It's very easy for me to confirm that this is the right Marissa Duarte. And I can look and see that, uh, you know, this is her educational background. I know that if I email her, I should be calling her uh, dear Dr. Duarte, things like that, right? There's so much information contained in this profile. And it's partly because she puts it out there as a service. So to get started with an ORCID ID is pretty easy. Um, you can actually, we have a link coming up where you can just go and fill out your profile. A related concept that sometimes comes up for people is something called a DOI or a digital object identifier. This is the same kind of concept in that it's a barcode that's attached to a digital object or digital product. Um, so sometimes this can be a little bit confusing if you've heard both of these concepts but never had them sort of like explained or clarified. Um, so just remember that most interactions with DOIs will be handled at the publisher level and DOIs are assigned to outputs and not to authors. So to get started with ORCID, um, you can just fill out this registration. I've already done this. So, um, you know, when I log in, you would see the kind of start of my little skeleton profile that I put in here. But it's pretty easy. You just need to, you know, fill out this basic information. And then I do believe that they have a little like a approval process to just kind of make sure that you're not registering for someone else's account or something like that. And then they send you an email and you're in the system. I'm going to close this window because it keeps tricking me. Oh, see, Jaleesa, there, I figured that out. That's what you cannot do. Okay, so you cannot. Jaleesa and I were fig trying to figure out the easiest way to uh, get this to toggle back and forth. And now it has defeated me. So let me go to that URL. And as discussed, it works great. We're back in, everything's okay. And let me just jump right back to where we were. Thank you for your patience. All right, so we have that link for the easy registration. And then we also have this link on how to use ORCID. So this is a nice little YouTube video that just kind of walks you through how to actually get started. Uh, creating an ORCID account, and even configuring some of the more advanced settings like importing things. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. Um, we won't watch it together because we have quite a bit that we're going through. Um, so some final thoughts on ORCID. Um, might be required in some disciplines, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is a great thing to talk to your mentor, uh, someone in your department, basically anyone who has some experience. So it might be required in some disciplines for grants and publications, um, but you know, it's not for everyone. So there's, I can't give you kind of blanket advice there. So that's the kind of thing that you need that discipline specific knowledge. It's also a great time to reach out to your uh, library liaison if you're not totally sure what you need to be doing. Just remember it's a durable permanent URL and ID. So like we saw with Marissa Duarte, her entry will be up there for as long as we can tell, as long as the internet's gonna be around for now. And remember that there's that automated update available. So if you're someone who's already underway on a research career, this could be really handy. Um, I have this highlighted because it's kind of like a procedural thing. So I know it's kind of, we're doing this sort of like out of order. So just something to keep in mind is that you can't export from ORCID to something called Google Scholar Profile. And we're gonna go into what Google Scholar Profile is in just a second here. Um, but you can import from Google Scholar Profile to ORCID. So an order of operations might be maybe starting with Google Scholar, getting that set up the way that you like with your core information and then importing that into ORCID. 
So let's talk a little bit about Google Scholar Author Profiles. This is basically Google's version of an ORCID style profile and it holds um, articles as well as citation stats. This isn't something that we have on the um, ORCID one, right? So for instance, over here on Marissa's ORCID, we don't actually have anything about her sort of citation stats. So how many times people are using or citing her articles, how many downloads she has, those types of things. So one of the things that you get with the Google Scholar presence is an actual kind of citation uh, metrics that are built off of Google's internal citations um, and the metrics that it has via its connections. So it's a similar kind of format where we have her name, um, a little bit about her, a little bit about her affiliation, as well as a link to her personal website. Um, and then we have her publications here, right? So we can see uh, her publications. I think we can order it by year. So I can see, okay, um, this is what she's been up to. I actually had not seen these two articles, so maybe I'll make sure to check those out. So you can have a profile like this for your, yourself. Um, obviously, uh, Dr. Duarte has a very impressive publication record. So, you know, yours might only be a couple things as you get started. And it's pretty easy to get your own profile. Um, you can see I actually haven't done this yet, but it's a pretty straightforward thing where you can kind of start filling it out. And then you actually will need to tell it where your articles are. So my articles are forthcoming. Um, this is a presentation from earlier this year. So I could actually try to select this and add this to my profile if that was something that I wanted to do. This is pretty straightforward to do, um, but if at any point you're trying any of these processes and you have questions, um, it's a great idea to reach out to me or to the library in general and we can help you um, with what you're working on. Um, so let me see, let me drive, jump back into this one. Uh, Jaleesa, should we maybe pause for a second just to see if there's any questions in the chat or that people wanna ask? Sure, we don't have any questions in the chat yet, um, but we can definitely take a second to see if, if anyone has anything that they would like to ask. Sure, and we'll also have time for questions at the end too. All right, well, we'll keep on cruising. If you do have a question, uh, feel free to, you know, th throw it in the chat or to mention in the chat that you have a question and we can pause and ask you. So like I mentioned, uh, Google Scholar Advantages, you can import to ORCID from a Google Scholar profile. So um, this is an actual guide built by a librarian at the University of Iowa, and it kind of walks you through it. The kind of idea with this basically is that you can set up a really nice profile in Google and then easily, uh, well, I'll say relatively easily, export it into ORCID. So there's pretty straightforward steps on how to do this. If you've ever imported anything into a system before like this, you'll probably be able to get it. Um, but it's definitely something that if you want some help, just reach out to the library. Um, they can get you in touch with me and we'll get you situated um, in importing it. And the other thing to know about Google Scholar is that you can have it set up so that automated search results can automatically be added to your profile. Now, for some people, this could be great. I have a really unique last name. So the only other people who have my last name are my two siblings, and neither of them publish in library science. So personally, I might turn on Google Scholar profile, um, have it automatically add those results. What that means is basically is that Google is noticing when something comes up and it says, oh, Marco Valencia published this and it assigns it to me. Now, I did say my name's pretty uh, unique, but my parts of my last name are pretty common, right? So Valencia is a very, very common last name. So when I've had the automatic uh, search results added before, I've ended up getting citations from people in you know, the sciences and mathematics and all these other disciplines. Those aren't my articles. So keep in mind that um, one of the things that both of these services are trying to do is help you to distinguish yourself since there are so many uh, commonalities in names. And it also helps you to track um, yourself in case you have a situation where maybe your name changes over time or you're publishing under a different name than you used to be. Uh, this is what I just mentioned about those automatic updates can be a curse. So make sure to regularly check or switch to manual updates. Basically, you just want to make sure that it's actually functioning the way you're expecting. And if you're interested, this article does a really nice job of going into kind of the pros and cons of Google Scholar profile. And I think uh, the author even talks a bit about how to uh, import into ORCID. Um, so this is a nice thing that if you're kind of interested and you want to know some more of the specifics, you can kind of dive in. 
But at this level, you have kind of enough to get you started with both of these as profile options for scholarly publications, scholarly presentation, and other work uh, like white papers, things like that work that you'd be sharing in that kind of context. So traditional measures of scholarly impact. So we talked a lot about articles now. And of course, it's not just that you're publishing articles, but it's partly what are the articles doing and what are the impact. So I mentioned on uh, Marissa Duarte's page that we could see some of her stats. So let me see if I can pull that back up. And so here on her Google Scholar page, let me just go back. So we can see some of her stats, which is showing you citations, H index, and I10 index. So hopefully Google's giving us a little pop up here, um, but basically, the kind of summary is that these are sort of proprietary ways of calculating the impact of a particular article or a particular author or a particular journal. So it's sort of like a credit scores where they're put forth by different companies. It's kind of a closed box. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, traditional metrics here in a moment. Citations are a little bit more straightforward. And the reason why is that it's just literally like who published something in something peer reviewed that cited one of Marissa Duarte's articles, right? And so altogether, she's had 2004, and you can see that she's a pretty recent scholar because the majority of those citations are happening since 2015, right? And in an individual article in Google Scholar, we can get this information in a lot of different ways. Um, the way that I like to do it is just to kind of actually go into Google Scholar and search the title. And then you can see, okay, here she is. And this will tell you cited by, this is a very recent article, so there's nothing here. Let's try um, an older one so I can better illustrate that for you. Here you can see the cited by as well. It's showing me the total. So let's look at like this article that has a few more citations on it. Here you can see it's now showing me in the metadata. This is the title, she's the author. It's been cited 35 times. Related articles is Google using its algorithm to tell you, oh, well, if you like this article about network sovereignty, then you'll probably like these other articles. And this can be very handy during research, but it's important in the world of metrics to understand that this is really an algorithmic service that Google's providing, as opposed to the citations, which is really telling you something about um, this article has been cited in this formal scholarly process that we've been doing for a long time. And, well before um, web algorithms existed. So journals have specific rankings. So, you know, articles basically, we talk about the number of citations as a method of impact in terms of traditional scholarly impact. For journals, we then think about, well, what is sort of the aggregate impact of its articles, right? So journal impact factor is the best known example of this uh, kind of calculating. And I'll show you a couple of ways to find that information. So you can find metrics on a particular journal via basically thinking about it from its discipline first. So for instance, journal impact factor is the uh, big one that we see for um, uh, science journals. And you can see here that my link's not working here. So rest assured that I'll get this presentation updated. I think we had a recent shift and I clearly missed that one in getting that updated. Uh, similarly with Scopus, this might be one that you would use for, um, I would say, your other, your less hard sciences and more your social science disciplines. Um, but Julissa, you may actually have a, a perspective on that. Do you have a, a, any, uh, do you typically recommend Scopus for people in your discipline? I typically recommend for people in the social sciences to look at both. So to look at journal impact factor as well as some of the data that Scopus provides, specifically in the social sciences, and you have that listed there as the SJR, so the Simago journal rank, uh, seems to be used um, by some individuals in the social sciences and also in like library and information science. Um, and depending on the journal or the discipline, you might have a journal that's listed in both of those places. And right. so, I say to, to try both, but at least in the social sciences, um, Web of Science, as well as the SJR and Scopus tend to be used pretty re regularly. That's very helpful. And so, you know, to kind of clarify this for people who are really new to this concept, if you've ever looked at your credit score and you've been like, well, I've got an Experian credit score and I've got a, 
I don't know what the other ones are, you know, whatever the alternate ones, it's, it's like, and they're similar and related, but they're also distinct, right? So you may be interested in looking at a journal's impact factor as well as evaluating its site score, the SJR or the SNP, just like Jalisa mentioned. Sorry, we've got some automated here happening. Let's get that back on track. Similarly, we talked about Google Scholar metrics, which is basically Google's sort of take on these same um, kind of concepts. I would say though that Google Scholar metrics are so new that they haven't necessarily been officially cited and, or excuse me, sort of officially incorporated into our disciplines. So you may hear, for instance, if you're in a, a competitive area of publishing that you need to look for a journal with a particular impact factor um, to make sure that you're publishing at the level that you need. Whereas no one's saying, well, go look at the Google Scholar metrics on a journal yet. So just kind of keep that in mind that this is more for sort of uh, information and research on your part, whereas these figures are considered more um, official and, you know, sometimes in a particular discipline, you need to make sure that you're publishing in something with a certain impact factor. So I'll make sure that I get that link in place. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about traditional metrics, that could probably be just like a whole session unto itself because it's a pretty in-depth topic. So I've included a couple of different resources um, that you can explore if you're interested in learning more about those. Uh, we have a YouTube video that dives into how journal metrics and rankings work. We have a citation, research and impact metrics. If you're uh, more interested in reading information, this is a handy little libguide that takes you through um, kind of exploring this a little bit more in terms of what journal impact factor is. Um, if you're someone who's really interested in learning how it's calculated, you can find that information um, and actually get into it. Or you can just kind of take the higher level approach of knowing I need to look for a journal that's you know, at this minimum, or I need to make sure that I have a balance of journals, for instance, right? I need to make sure that at least a few of the things that I'm publishing are in a journal with the appropriate ranking for my discipline. We also have a really in-depth workshop that was put together by um, someone who was in my role previously. And so this is um, just another really great resource. It's, it's a pretty long presentation, it's 52 slides, but she goes into a great job discussing um, traditional metrics and alt metrics and helping you to understand impact factors. So if you're interested, um, please do check out these resources. Um, you're also welcome to follow up with me and Jalisa um, if you have any questions or if there's anything we can do to kind of expand on this point since we're only touching on it relatively briefly. A similar concept is alt metrics. So basically, if you think about that uh, kind of idea I laid out earlier of the way uh, we used to establish a scholarly presence versus how we establish a scholarly presence now, alt metrics is something that definitely comes from the web, right? So most websites have trackers installed that we're keeping track of how many people are visiting a website, sometimes where they're coming from in terms of general location information, how long you spent on a particular page, um, all this kind of information that's sort of like um, how marketers in old school, you know, sort of television advertising, it's sort of like their dream, right? If I could just have this real time information of how long you look at the TV, what's exciting to you, what you put on mute, that kind of thing. So the information out there on the internet is partly amassed via all these sort of automatic collection tools, which is something that then we can also do with sort of the scholarly sphere, right? So alt metrics in terms of scholarly presence includes things like social media shares, downloads, linking or bookmarking of articles, blog posts, even sometimes Twitter threads in certain citation managers or other different systems for keeping track of different citations. It's not the same as scholarly metrics, but it's a useful addition. Uh, the metrics toolkit is a helpful interactive guide to the many types of metrics out there. So let's take a look and see what this is talking about. Um, basically, there's so many different metrics because there's so many different ways that uh, different organizations are attracting or collecting and soliciting information from you, right? So you can see here, this is a kind of comprehensive list of different alt metrics that people might talk about. Now, some of these things may seem sort of unusual to you to see, like, for instance, like Facebook posts, you know, that we spend all this time training our scholars that like, well, Facebook isn't a scholarly source. Um, but of course, the landscape has changed really radically in the past 20 years, right? And so if you think about it, if you have someone who's a subject expert and they post a long form 
uh, post on Facebook and they lay out some of their expertise. Maybe it's about like an archeological discovery or something, right? And let's say it goes viral and you know, 15,000 people share it and 3,000 people comment. Well, that's a, a huge way that that scholar has engaged with their community, right? And for some scholars, that may be um, an even more critical engagement than a traditional kind of forum like publishing in a journal, because maybe their community's impacted or their community's represented. Maybe that's not a, a community that's going to even really know or notice about the journal. So thinking about these different metrics, um, pretty much anything out there that kind of collects data can potentially be an alt metric. So for another example, you'll see GitHub on here. So if you're someone who writes code or shares code as part of your job, if you have a GitHub or a similar kind of space where you're sharing your code, your figures and stats there are also part of your scholarly presence, right? So your repository itself is part of your presence. And then those alt metrics about how people are using it help to tell the story of the impact of your research. So you can see, um, this website, I like it because it helps you to kind of really brainstorm and think about all of these different options, Twitter mentions, Wikipedia citations, as well as more traditional things like journal acceptance rate, right? So if you're someone that can say, well, I've, you know, had a 95% acceptance rate, well, great, you know, figure out how to tell that story. So all metrics are sort of about exploring some of the new technology we have and thinking about how we can use it to tell the story of your research, your scholarly presence, and your scholarly impact. Um, Metrics Toolkit, like I mentioned, that's a great resource and you should check it out. Um, it also gives you a little plugin that you can add to your actual browser. So if you're curious about how to do this, um, the Alt Metrics plugin is explained in depth on this page. And basically, it's just a little bookmarklet that you can add. And then what it does is when you're looking at a particular page, it'll actually show you the altmetric information that's available for it. So let's see if we can install it live. I actually haven't used it on this browser before. So I'm being dangerous here and trying it out. Um, but basically, it looks like you can sign up for it fairly easy. So let's just try it. And the thing that I like about having this installed is that it gives you um, some opportunities to kind of just easily check and to sort of just getting into thinking about um, this as uh, a way that you should be interacting with content out there on the web, right? So thinking about, oh, if you're reading a really great, great Twitter thread from someone, uh, you can, you know, kind of altmetric it and check and see, and maybe it's something that other people are citing, and maybe that helps you to expand your own idea of your scholarly presence as well as for other people. Okay, so you can see I gave it a little bit of information. It says drag it into my bookmark bar, which maybe is up here. Sure, I guess we'll need to watch this little quick video to see. Okay. Hmm. I don't know, y'all. Is this not a bookmark bar, Jalisa? <laughs> I wonder if on your Mac you maybe aren't don't have the bookmarks bar visible or something, because I know like sometimes on Chrome you can hide it or turn it on or off, but I don't know enough about Macs to get that. It might be. There yeah, the go. toolbar. There you go. There we go. I asked a librarian and she came through. Thank you, Jalisa. <laughs> All right, so let's now take a look. We'll go back over to Melissa Duarte's. Um, uh, let's just pick a random article. I don't even know who this one is, but that's okay. So let's say we are interested in this one and we'll click Alt Metrics. We got to click Got It and clear that out. We click this. And we should then now see a little pop up with some information. Um, it looks like this one is actually struggling. I see a JavaScript arrow down at the bottom. We'll try it. We'll give it one more try. We're going to accept all cookies. And you can see here, right? So this is an article um, by Kim Christian, who I actually worked with at Washington State University. So it's funny that one popped up. And we can see that this article has been tweeted 91 times, right? And so I can click for more details. And I can see that this article, which is about slow archives, which is about um, indigenous representation in terms of how we think about archives and indigenous presence in archives, we can see that it's been mentioned by 91 tweeters. So it's had a bit of a community impact. 
but interestingly, it's only been cited once. Um, that's probably because it's a pretty fresh article, right? So we can see that this actually came out in June 2019. So that's pretty recent. Um, probably folks are citing it right now and those articles themselves are in process. And as I mentioned um, vaguely, I, earlier I alluded to the fact that things can be, um, we can kind of keep track of citations and citation managers. So we can see that 29 people stored this as a citation. In addition, we can get a sense of where people are coming from. And this is interesting, um, especially since I, I know Dr. Christian. Um, you can see actually that a fair number of her tweeters are in Australia. And that's partly because she does work with um, Aboriginal people in Australia, um, including sort of centering their perspectives and archives. So from here right away, you can get quite a bit of information about somebody. And you can see that there's you know, varying levels of information available. And we might even be able to see the tweets um, that it's been mentioned in. So this can be important. Uh, something to keep in mind with tweets is tweets are not necessarily endorsements, right? And tweets are also not citations. So we can see right away that a number of these tweets where um, this is coming up as an article that's mentioned, uh, they're sort of technical tweets saying something's happening or someone's giving a presentation. Uh, tweets may also be a sign of controversy about an article. So don't assume that just because something has, you know, 5,000 tweets, that's because everyone's tweeting that they love it. Um, that's in fact probably a good sign to investigate that and, and check it out. So you can see there just how easy it is to get the alt metric started. Um, and I, I really recommend trying this one out because it's just a, a fun thing that you can have in your browser. And like I said, it gets you into sort of thinking about scholarly presence and all these different dimensions of it that we have in our, our new digital landscape. So like I said, here's this link to this guide. Um, there's tons of support out there if you need it. Uh, but you can also, uh, as usual, reach out to me or the library and we'll get you set up. So before I dive into social media and professional web presence, uh, Jaleesa, I just thought I'd take a second and check to see if we have any uh, questions or comments on any of the content so far. No questions yet. Okay. All right. So social media and professional web presence. Um, first, I included this link, uh, and this is for folks who like to read content and who sort of like kind of formal systems for thinking about things. Um, some people who are more into this kind of processing than I am have put forward these kind of different ideas of thinking about your academic persona. So there's like a formal self that's like, you know, who you are when you're like applying for a job, the network self, which is like who you are maybe when you're in communication, you know, what does that kind of person look like when you're networking either in person or digitally, um, so on and so, so forth. Now, I'm putting this in here because I do think it might resonate with some folks. And so for you all, I suggest, you know, check this link out, maybe investigate these concepts a little bit more. I found this a little bit dry. So I decided to kind of do my own take on it, right? So here, here you can see I got my tweets on here got a little spacing problem, but you know how it goes. So uh, this is an example from my own Twitter, and I'm gonna take you through three examples of what I feel are different types of social media presence. So here's a tweet um, where one of my uh, followers and a person I follow is tweeting about an opportunity for indigenous game developers. And um, I'm including this because I feel like this is a good example of a sort of like a professional use of Twitter social media, right? So I'm following this person, She's posting about this. This is a professional opportunity. I want to make sure that my colleagues um, who might be interested in this and who might be good sharing points know about this. Um, so I retweet it myself and then it's something that's filed in my brain. And so I find out about all kinds of different stuff that's happening in my various areas of research interest uh, via a mechanism like this, right? So just seeing somebody's tweets um, and checking it out. And you'll notice though that I did go ahead and redact this because I also use my Twitter in a semi-private way. And so I don't really want it to be totally easy for you all to see who this person is and then go track it down. Although if you're truly devoted to it, you can search this and it's, it's not gonna be that hard, right? So keep in mind that your social media, even if you have it on a private setting, you should still think of it as being public. And if there's something that you're truly, truly worried about how it might impact your professional representation, then you might want to think about, you know, creating anonymous spaces for yourself to have a little bit more expression. I'm sorry to say, I mean, I know that we have like liberty and intellectual freedom as one of our ideals, but just as sort of a practical matter, that's the kind of strategy that I've taken 
and that I see frequently offered up as sort of the suggestion here. So a second um, example of social media and professional web presence. So this is someone who um, they're kind of complaining about it as some research that they saw. So they saw someone saying uh, that women experience basic emotions more intensely, except perhaps anger. They had some questions about if this is innately true as the author is implying. So they checked out his citations, right? And three said nothing relevant and one says what he says verbatim. So then he looks into those citations and it turns out that those citations uh, actually don't support the original claim. So I'm including this one because it's, I would say, a quasi-professional one, right? So this is still dealing with research. I mean, it's not just like a cute dog meme. It's something that I'm using here teaching um, to, as, a, as a point, you know, so it's, it's definitely professional in many contexts. But this is also someone who's kind of, uh, you know, ribbing this author, um, they're expressing their opinion. And this might be something that is a little bit more um, opinionated than I would express, for instance, like in a class or something like that, right? So this is what I would say is sort of a kind of a medium level in your social media presence and something where you can still be engaging in kind of your scholarly presence while having um, a bit of levity and, you know, understanding that it's a humorous environment. And then, of course, you have like just all out humorous um, content. And again, these are all coming from my Twitter, uh, on which many uh, people who I admire follow me and I follow them. And so this is uh, just something that popped up on my feed. It's actually uh, a meme that's making an association between um, Bigfoot report locations, uh, the location of IHOP restaurants, and then we have Mulder saying, Scully, <laughs> you're not going to believe this. And so I included this example because I do sometimes retweet things like this that I think are funny. Um, and each time I do it, I do have a little bit of a pause and thinking about, oh my goodness, um, Michelle Caswell, who's an eminent researcher in archive science is following me, right? So you need to think about what your own comfort level is um, in terms of your social media presence, right? So uh, I think the most important thing is to be intentional about it and to just not have an accident, right? So I understand when I'm retweeting goofy stuff like this, um, there's definitely sort of a limit and there's other, uh, you know, content that maybe is only for sort of a personal level that maybe I have separate social media or maybe I kind of carve out separate social media channels. So that's just to kind of give you some different flavors of what your presence on social media might look like and how you might have a scholarly presence. Um, and just before we conclude this session, I will also say that sometimes I'm surprised at the academic colleagues that respond to the funny tweets like this one. And so it's important that you can be your whole self in all of the different spaces that you're in as much as possible. So I know I did just say that you do want to kind of keep in mind that what you're putting out there is kind of publicly available. But I don't think that that means that you always have to be rigid or scholarly in one particular way. It's important to build connections with other scholars because we're all people and that's one of the most enriching parts of, of what we're doing and what's exciting about sharing your research. So for a professional web presence, um, I recommend developing something like this, especially if you are going to have an active social media presence, just because it kind of helps to balance out that content that people might find. Um, and it also just gives people one more way to find things out about you. So I personally use LinkedIn for my professional profile. Um, my kind of work history is there and I have a lot of my work connections. If you've never used LinkedIn, um, I definitely do recommend like watching like this little video. It's pretty short, um, only a minute and a half, but it just gives you a couple of quick tips that can help to make your LinkedIn a little bit more um, appealing and exciting and uh, useful for people. We also have something at the University of Idaho called uh, in vivo or vivo. And so basically what this does is it actually lets you build a little profile. I see Jalisa is here, so we're gonna pick on her because here she is and she's done a nice job filling her out, her profile out here. So we can see her positions, her official role. She's the liaison to the College of Arts, Letters and Social Sciences. She's the social sciences librarian. We can see her various academic articles. And she even has these little altmetric links here, right? So we can see that her article here was tweeted by three times and has been put in Mendeley by readers three times as well. So this is very similar to ORCID or Google Scholar. Uh, this is a service that we subscribe to and maintain for you as a University of Idaho connected person. Um, so if it's something you're interested in finding out more, just look up Vivo and you can sign up for an account and go ahead and fill this out. Uh, so just another option. Uh, to kind of round out your professional scholarly web presence. 
Uh, to kind of wrap up that discussion, just make sure to search yourself so you know what's out there. Uh, I do recommend trying to tie up your loose end digital web presences. So ghost projects can give people the impression that you're still working on things that you're not. They can make people think that you're an undergrad or a graduate student when maybe you've moved on um, to some upper echelon of your career. And just keep in mind that if you're feeling overwhelmed, you don't have to do all of these things at once. A lot of them, once you get them set in place, are kind of sort of set it and forget it, like the ORCID ID, you only have to go through and sign up for that once. Or once you establish your kind of Google Scholar profile the way that you want, you only need to check on it from time to time to make sure it looks the way that you need in terms of your citations. So just keep in mind that um, you don't have to do it all to be successful. Pick one or two. Um, it's better to have a really solid digital presence on one or two platforms than to have, you know, sort of a half, half their presence on a lot of different ones. We talked about Twitter a little bit, um, but keep in mind that even other social media platforms like Facebook or even Instagram are all places that I've seen uh, significant scholarly social media presences form. Um, and you can be creative with it. You know, some people in science disciplines use Facebook or Instagram or Twitter to share uh, research to make things a little bit more accessible and approachable for the community. Um, I personally do a lot of research on indigenous education and Twitter is just an amazing space for that. Um, you can learn so much about different communities also that you're not a part of on Twitter. So it's a great place to kind of cross pollinate and get ideas as well as to kind of put forth your own idea out there. But of course, you do want to make sure that um, you put forth things in a way that you're comfortable. So don't be afraid to use a private account when you need to. Don't be afraid to switch your account from private to public as needed. Um, there's all kinds of security concerns in this day and age. So don't feel like you have to be out there tweeting to be successful. You can kind of pick the platforms that are going to work for you. Finally, um, something that frequently comes up in uh, these conversations are sites like academia.edu and ResearchGate. Um, these can be confusing sites because they seem to be like, hey, give me your paper and I'm going to put it out and everyone can find it and it's going to be really cool. And it's like, what's not to like about that? And there's a few things not to like about the way that they do it. Um, specifically, they take your whole address book. They send you a lot of email. Um, they're commercial businesses, so they kind of sell the data that you're putting in one way or the other. And they're not really geared around long term preservation. So basically, when you share something with academia.edu or ResearchGate, it's totally up to you. But just keep in mind that it's sort of like when you log on to Facebook and you upload your cute photos, like you're giving them content that then they own and then they do different things to make money with. So, in terms of a sort of purely kind of um, nonprofit model, an open access repository is a better choice. Um, there's a lot of different options out there. So I've included just a couple of links. So the first is just a list to open repositories in general. And then the second, this nature list is uh, repositories with a bit more of a specific science focus. So with that, um, let's just kind of wrap up. So our most important takeaways are be conscientious about your social media and digital presence. Um, so whatever you decide you want to explore, just make sure that you kind of start slow, uh, build up incrementally, and be conscientious about what's out there. It's always a good idea, if you can, to go and take down um, that old MySpace or whatever that maybe doesn't put forth the most professional image. But it's also OK um, to make sure that you keep your whole self in the digital realm. So just be intentional and conscientious about it. Uh, building good scholarly presence habits now will help you throughout your career. Uh, so the earlier you can adapt to these things, uh, the easier it is. Um, I know even as a relatively recent uh, master's student, uh, I didn't really learn very much about scholarly presence um, in process, and so I'm learning about it now. So it's definitely never too late to learn, but if you get used to using an ORCID um, or you get used to updating your Google Scholar profile now, it just makes your life easier for your future um, endeavors. And librarians are here to help. So I mentioned this at many points throughout, um, but I'm Marco Sifley Valencia. You can always email me for any help about any of these topics. And as you saw, uh, Jaleesa is always an ex is also an expert in her own right. And we have many other experts in the library who can help you as well. And with that in mind, I will encourage you to tune back in for some more graduate student essentials. Uh, coming up, we have citation management with Zotero. Uh, we have Microsoft Excel, data management, and poster creation. Uh, all of these, I think, are going to be fantastic sessions. I especially encourage you to check out citation management with Zotero just in the context of sort of scholarly presence, um, because basically this is all about how you can keep track 
of uh, articles and sources as you're researching. Um, so that session next week, I think would be a, a really nice uh, connecting to connector point to this session um, and to just kind of get you thinking about what does it mean to establish a research career and getting out there and finding other people's work as well. And definitely make sure to check out those October sessions as well. And thank you all so much for tuning in. With uh, that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll just open this up uh, for any questions or comments. We did have a couple of questions in the chat. Someone um, had asked if you could talk about ResearchGate, but then said that you had already kind of mentioned it. So if they have further questions, they can definitely ask those. Um, but then we had a question where someone was asking if you were familiar with who's who. They said that it should be a network for professionals, but they aren't really sure. Okay, great question. So um, if the person who has the research gate question, if you need more information, um, feel free to like raise your hand in the chat or, or say something in the chat and we'll, we'll jump over to you. Um, the who's who I am only vaguely, vaguely familiar with. Um, I feel like who's who was kind of a pre-internet version of networking. And so I'm familiar with uh, the who's who's directory actually um, they used to list all kinds of people in it and so or they used to have editions of them that would list all kinds of people in different disciplines and so I think I was actually listed in one in high school for some like science fair thing which sounds really crazy but I did competitive international science fair and basically it was like this listing that was sort of like here's a bunch of you know students in the high school range who are doing this type of science and it was a who's who's listing and it had my name and I think a little bit of information about how to contact me. Um, does the person who asked that question, is there a digital who's who's now, or is that something that you're, you're hearing about? Um. Hello, Marco, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. This is Amelia speaking. I asked the question about uh, who's who uh, professional organization. So I keep uh, uh, receiving these emails uh, saying, congratulations, you, are, you have been nominated. <laughs> become a member uh, of this professional organization. This is very, um, uh, very high ranked uh, professional organization in the United States. Uh, I, I'm not so sure where the, uh, they uh, got my information and how they started to send, uh, to send me emails, but uh, I don't feel very comfortable to, uh, to build a profile there. I'm not so sure if that's the right person. The, the right person who is the chair of the committee or any uh, any type of head of the uh, organization so <laughs> i was a little bit hesitant about it and that's why i asked the question yeah 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 i think you are very smart and i'm really glad you brought this up because i, I think your instinct there is right on um, i just pulled up their website i think this is very similar to sort of the research gate example that I just talked about where this is a company that's like harvesting information and then putting it out there and then they make money off of people what visiting the website via advertisement right so um, I guess my advice there would be if you wanted to participate you know I doubt anything bad would happen beyond you getting even more spam mail but I also am not familiar with who's who at, nor do I think it's a burgeoning um, sort of credible place, right? So I think basically a lot of um, opportunistic companies are realizing like, oh, well, you know, we can create a website and our service is harvesting content. And so the who's who, they're trying to get you to give them the content so then they can populate their website. And they're trying to sort of present it to you as a really prestigious thing. And I, I do think that it's sort of a continuation of those old directories that I listed, but those were also weird and random, you know, and I don't really, I partly know about that because I was listed in one and I don't really know how that came to happen and I never had anyone contact me out of it. So I don't really quite know, but okay, uh, thank, I, you. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you so I, much. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I can see Brian sending some very, very useful links. Uh, about who's who being scam. So <laughs> thank yeah. you, Brian, and thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good question. And I will include that um, in the session next time because it's really helpful to know what people are getting those kind of random spams about. 
um, <laughs> yeah. and are, what, what they're being invited to do. And then did the person with the, the research gate question, did they have any else, anything else they wanted to add or any further questions on that? It doesn't look like anything related to the research gate question has been added in chat, but we do have another question. If you change fields and they are not directly related, is it a good idea to include publications from other fields or only your current field in your scholarly profile? Well, that's a really good question and I would say that would be strategic. I would say that if your previous publications are scholarly, then I would go ahead and include them because it shows your scholarly trajectory. Um, however, there may be some disciplines that unfortunately perhaps are a bit biased towards other disciplines and so maybe you have one of each, you know, so for instance maybe your Google Scholar profile is where you put like literally everything that you've ever published but then maybe your ORCID you're only updating that with your kind of current to your research discipline and ongoing. Um, that would be one approach that I might take. But I, I would think that um, unless there's some kind of inherent contradiction between your fields, I would think that it would be an advantage to have those all in one place. Um, Jalisa, I would love your thoughts on that though as uh, the other librarian facilitating. I would agree that if the research that you're including in those profiles is scholarly in nature, that individuals even in other disciplines might be interested in research that you did in a previous discipline, because it does show, uh, like you said, Marco, your trajectory as a researcher, and it could be very helpful for you to show that over time that you have done research in a variety of areas, maybe you're open to things like interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary collaboration. So I think so long as you still have positive feelings and perspectives on that previous research you've done, to go ahead and include it. I think that it could, it could be a positive outcome. Yeah, and you know, I suppose if you're in a situation where you don't wanna include it, you know, that's also an option. Uh, people do sometimes publish under pseudonyms and things like that. So, you know, you're kind of the, the author here. I mean, you are the author, but you're also like the author of this record. And so I would say, think about the story that you're trying to tell. So if for some reason right now you think that that past research complicates your story, then it's okay to leave it off. And in fact, in some ways you're kind of controlling the narrative because people will find your Google Scholar profile and they're more likely to look at that as opposed to then, you know, randomly searching and digging up that old thing that you wrote about, you know, that contradictory topic or whatever. So I, I, something I should have mentioned is, I think one of the big goals of your scholarly presence is partly you're kind of like putting your, your, your information out there partly so that you can tell the story and so that people don't have to go and ferret around to, to find out information. So if you are someone who wants a clean break with your past research, well then don't include it on your ORCID ID or don't include it on your Google Scholar and it'll be sort of like it never happened um, because people are not gonna be very inclined to uh, really investigate unless you know they have some sort of reason to. All right, well, um, I hope this was a helpful session for folks. Um, if you have any questions or you want any more in-depth consultation on any of the topics, like I said, we are here and available. Um, I specifically can help you, the library in general. And uh, is, there, is there any other topics that people were hoping would be covered and, and maybe we didn't get, get to or um, any feedback like that that we might incorporate for the next session? We'll also be giving you a digital survey too. So just, just in case folks have anything they wanna throw out while we're here together. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby, that's very nice. Uh, Jalisa just put a link to the survey um, so make sure to check that out. You can let us know how we did, uh, topics you want to hear more or less on, that kind of thing. I can't remember what's on that survey now that I say that, Jalisa. I think it's more a rank what you knew and what you didn't know. Um, but basically, you can just give us some comments um, here or on email. <laughs> and yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, have a great rest of your day and have fun creating your scholarly presences.